Good morning. Um, we need to stop scheduling Logan for seminars so winter will actually end. This is our second snowstorm on Logan's Day. So um, I'm Heather Nelson, and I'm happy to introduce my friend and colleague, Logan Spector, today. Logan comes from the exotic home state of Connecticut. Um, before coming here, he was at Emory, where he did a PhD in epidemiology. He is currently professor and division head of Pediatric Epidemiology and Clinical Research in the Division of Pediatrics Department, Department of Pediatrics. Um, he held several important national positions, including in the Children's Oncology Group and a standing member of the EPICS Study Section, which reviews epidemiology grants. Um, so, you know, Logan, we know his research in leukemia and osteosarcoma, but really he's our infrastructure guy, and he's... Um, He's great to work with because he's so creative and thinks out of the box. So if you've been to the State Fair and seen the D2D building or been a part of any research that happened there, that's because of Logan. That was his very smart idea that he made happen. Um, he's got another initiative that's infrastructure related at the Minnesota Population Center doing a Minnesota population database, which is sort of like Utah's example on a Minnesota scale, which is something we could very easily used for cancer studies here at MCC. And today he's going to talk about his other great idea that we're pursuing, which is the 10,000 family study. So thank you, Logan. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> I might have had the kernel of the idea, but uh, there's definitely a team um, bringing it to fruition. Uh, it, you know, this is a, absolutely a team effort, and I'll talk more about that. So uh, I composed these slides in, in January when uh, the um, winter looked really topical, and then uh, had major deja vu yesterday. So I'm glad to those of you who made it in, and I'm, I'm glad we're able to, to hold it today. So um, today we're going to talk about the, the rationale for a Minnesota cohort, um, specifically the design of the 10,000 family study as we conceive of it today, uh, our pilot experience to date, uh, and then our path towards the, the full 10,000 families. Uh, and I'd just briefly like to note, we have a new uh, really professional looking logo that manages to be both uh, homey and um, uh, go gophers at the same time. So thank you. All right, so uh, this will be like a movie from the 1950s. We're gonna do the credits first so that you pay attention. All right, um, like I said, this is absolutely a team effort. Uh, honestly, my only insight was that uh, a, a school of public health, a major university, and, and a land-grant university need a cohort uh, to, to be healthy uh, research-wise, uh, and that's not really a brilliant insight. Um, but uh, I am glad that we have a core of faculty and staff that have don uh, donated um, immense amounts of time towards making the, the pilot uh, get this far. So. Um, our administrative and scientific leads are, are me, uh, Heather, uh, Deanne Lazovich. Uh, our sampling and recruitment team is uh, Jen Pointer in, in my division, Deanne, Heather, and Kevin Riley from Biostatistics. Laboratory team is uh, Bharat Theogarajan and uh, Anna Prismant. Uh, and then you see many of these names repeated for, for the other teams. Um, we are lucky to have uh, participation and uh, effort in kind from the Coordinating Centers for Biometric Research. This I'm gonna credit asking them to, to Deanne, who isn't here, who pointed out that uh, we can collect all the data we want, but uh, we should have the infrastructure in place to um, handle it. Uh, we're also getting help in kind from uh, the Advanced Research and Diagnostic Laboratory, or ARDL, which if you don't know, uh, is a laboratory, uh, central laboratory here on campus that handles a lot of large cohort studies uh, that have been ongoing since the 80s. So it's uh, the perfect place for um, our samples to end up. Uh, we have lots of volunteers, including current and former students and trainees, staff, especially Michelle Ressler, uh, who is not working entirely for free, uh, but mostly uh, Colleen Gary Carter, Sarah Putnam, Colin Campbell, and, and Sharon Minarath. Uh, and then I also would like to acknowledge the um, Cancer Center for being the uh, first body to acknowledge our brilliant idea uh, with funding. Uh, 
Uh, I should also thank the uh, OVPR uh, because we have steered some of the money we got for the Precision Medicine in Initiative uh, to uh, assist with this. Uh, and then lastly, although I've already said it, um, there were there have been many person hours that have been donated in kind. So everybody listed on this slide has donated a lot of their time. All right, so uh, just a little bit of background. And Marilyn, when I started, pointed out I had a lot of slides. So I guess I'll go through some of these kind of quickly. First of all, uh, every generation needs a new cohort uh, in order to keep up with changes in exposures and lifestyle uh, that um, happen over time. For instance, nobody born in the 70s uh, started using e-cigarettes as teenagers because they didn't exist. Uh, and now they do, and they need to be studied. Uh, new technology and samples also are needed. For years, cohorts were taking whole blood um, and maybe separating cells a little bit, but not necessarily preserving them as whole cells or thinking about downstream uses, perhaps because some of the downstream uses weren't possible. Um, so new cohorts need to take advantage of new collection methods. Nobody thought to be collecting um, stool samples back in the 70s because, well, nobody really wanted them and there was nothing to do with them. But of course, now we have an entire field of uh, you know, studying the microbiome, uh, and suddenly this has become important for a cohort to have. US cohorts uh, can uh, take advantage of substantially more diversity uh, than other countries. So uh, we always say that Scandinavia is heaven for epidemiologists. Uh, but I checked, and they're mostly Scandinavian, so uh, they only tell us a limited amount about uh, non-Scandinavian people. Uh, and then lastly, because there are other cohorts in the U.S. and elsewhere, we tried to come up with a study design that filled in some of the gaps that uh, other U.S. cohorts are not. Uh-oh, I hit the wrong one. There we go. So uh, just briefly, for those of you who aren't epidemiologists, um, a cohort study is um, uh, a gold standard for observational research. And it's considered the natural analog to a uh, randomized study. And basically, you take a population of interest, you assess their exposure or lack of exposure, and then you follow them up for outcome. The important thing is that the um, samples or the exposure assessment takes place before disease occurs, and therefore is less prone to, to bias. Our rationale for having one in Minnesota, other than all wanting to keep our jobs, uh, is that um, Minnesota has a substantial minority population, which isn't um, well represented nationally. Uh, so uh, we're all aware of uh, refugee groups who've made Minnesota home, including uh, Somali, Hmong, Karen, uh, and a very sizable population of uh, West Africans. Minnesota also has a substantial rural-urban uh, divide, almost evenly divided between urban and rural uh, in terms of the population. Uh, and um, there aren't any cohorts that are taking advantage of that. <clears throat> uh, as I alluded to, we also need to remain competitive nationally. Uh, we need a population uh, resource for uh, research in our catchment area, collaboration with our basic science colleagues, and participation uh, in consortia at an international level. Uh, I should add that uh, there are several schools of public health that uh, exist, subsist almost entirely on um, studies that uh, make use of some central cohorts that they have. At Minnesota, uh, the only large cohort that we've had for the last 30 years was the Iowa Women's Health Study which, as the name implies, uh, only enrolled women and took place in a different state. So uh, it is um, time for us to, to build our own cohort. Um, and lastly, uh, this isn't a school public health effort or a med school effort um, or even just a Masonic Cancer Center effort, although um, it is being steered by cancer faculty and with cancer as their primary interest. This will be a platform for research for the entire university. All right, so uh, we'll take the 10,000 foot view of what we envision as the design, and then we'll get into some specifics. So uh, as the name implies, we will be enrolling families, uh, roughly 10,000 of them, 
Surprisingly, I've had some people say, why 10,000 families, other than that it's a, a round number uh, and uh, gives us a reasonable sample size. Uh, we are the land of 10,000 lakes. In the world um, the speaker. And anybody who's driven will see that in the back of the license plate. So where the mystery comes from. Old school PC yellow. But uh, in any case, we settled on 10,000 yeah, families. That's day. a uh, guideline, not a, uh, a strict okay. number. Uh, it will be a family-based cohort with two to three generations of families living in Minnesota. Uh, and this study design gives us several things. Uh, it allows us to look at uh, the intergenerational transmission of risk, uh, which is an understudied area precisely because cohorts normally uh, enroll unrelated, uh, you know, atomized individuals. Um, it will allow the investigation of a continuous uh, continuum of numerous diseases uh, and, and allows us to look at both etiology, screening, outcomes, and survivorship. Um, and then uh, it will let us look at the developmental origins uh, of adult onset disease and disability. Um, for those of you who are aware of, uh, of you know, some epidemiologic classics, we're really trying to, to um, make 10,000 families a lot like the Framingham Heart Study, which started in Framingham, Mass. in, uh, what, 50s or 60s, and is now on their third generation. Um, albeit, Framingham is not a big town and uh, doesn't generalize even to the rest of Massachusetts. But we are looking for 10,000 families to be Framingham uh, writ large in Minnesota. This uh, next one's a very busy slide, but uh, we put it up here because it uh, talks about these axes of nested hierarchies um, where we have uh, global or state level uh, variables, um, macro level, which in our case would be county, mezzo level, which would be a personal environment, micro level, which would be family. And then uh, we can go within the body from uh, organ function, the cells, subcellular, or um, the genomic uh, context. So. Um, Cohort study will be, um, it will be possible to look at all levels of uh, influence on disease outcome. All right, so uh, our recruitment strategy is evolving, and uh, it really depends on the results of the pilot. Um, our original thought that we, was that we would uh, recruit solely from the birth files that are publicly available in, um, in the state for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, we would know something about the people that we're inviting. Um, number two, uh, we think that it's very important that this cohort represent the future of Minnesota, including its uh, ethnic diversity. Uh, and by sampling on new births, which are now 25% non-white, that would be kind of baked into the sampling scheme. Um, at the same time, we have lots of uh, very enthusiastic volunteers in this state, people who are enthused about the university and Masonic Cancer Center in particular. Uh, and um, we've already had requests by them to participate. So uh, we decided to open up a third of the families to um, people with affinity for the U or, or otherwise um, getting them through community events. And it remains to be seen you know, what our eventual uh, mix of methods will be. Uh, here's our expected sample size by generation, and um, we have a pretty loose definition of eligibility in order to maximize the number of families that will participate. So the ultimate number is going to be uh, a, a little bit flexible here. Um, but uh, of note, we plan to have uh, almost 30,000 grandparents. Those are the people who will, uh, if they haven't already developed cancer, be developing cancer in the um, relatively near future, uh, and therefore there will be some frank cancer outcomes uh, in the um, near future for people to, to study. Um, we are potentially going to have uh, 7,000 newborns if we go with 70% from the um, birth registry, uh, and then siblings, counting on uh, 1.7 kids per family, uh, would be about 5,000 newborns born into the cohort, and uh, prior siblings, uh, we estimated about 15,000. 
um, we would get uh, hopefully two parents per, um, and then uh, uh, grandparents. All right, so um, on the ground, here's how the pilot's gone. First of all, uh, we are very grateful of getting a Road to R award from the Masonic Cancer Center, uh, which started in the first quarter of 2017. Uh, and um, like most people, we spent a few weeks uh, just um, scratching our heads and wondering how we even get started on such a task. Uh, but then we assembled the group, which included inviting people who hadn't previously um, hadn't previously expressed interest in, in the study. Uh, in the second quarter, we started on our protocol, um, as well as an IRB application and a web portal. And uh, I don't want to minimize this work. Uh, we're talking about a multi-generational, longitudinal, and as long as we can sustain the funding, indefinite study uh, with very open consent for broad use of uh, samples and data. And so uh, this was a um, elaborate IRB application to, to prepare and, and get through. And I'm happy to say uh, that it, it went through with flying colors. So in the third quarter, we gained IRB approval just a few weeks before the state fair, which as you will all know is 12 days ending on Labor Day. And uh, we had a uh, just in time to do some recruitment uh, at the state fair, uh, which I'll detail in a little bit. Following that, uh, and actually this had been going the entire time, uh, came up with standard operating procedures for our um, health fairs, uh, as well as just contacting uh, interested participants. And we held uh, health fair number one. Uh, in the first quarter of this year, which is now, uh, we've started the um, sending letters to uh, new births in two areas in Minnesota. And we've also been updating our procedures based on uh, the um, health fair that we held in November. Uh, and then in the upcoming quarter, we're going to be uh, holding a couple more health fairs um, as well as uh, tracking how well our um, mailing is doing. So uh, here's the flow chart of participation. And we have these uh, very slick looking icons that um, Hugh Relations put together for us. Uh, so first, we need people to learn about the study. If that's at a community event like the state fair, uh, we can talk to them in person. Um, or else we mail them a letter directing them to our website. We ask them to register online. Uh, and then once they have registered, uh, we give them emails asking them to uh, invite their family members. Uh, complete questionnaires online that we have in REDCap. I'll go into a little bit about what we're asking. Um, and then uh, invite them to attend a health fair. Uh, and then lastly, we ask for permission to uh, get in touch uh, periodically. Right now, uh, with our pilot funding, we haven't planned on contacting them more than six months out. Um, but in the eventual study, we're going to want periodic contact to update their exposures, health conditions, uh, and get new samples. So uh, here's our web portal. It's at 10,000 families, spelled out, 10,000families.umn.edu. Um, and uh, it's uh, pretty slick looking and um, almost ready for the general public. Uh, we are um, working on a, a larger rollout, but uh, we can't really roll it out to the general public till we have the capacity to uh, enroll people. So uh, here's what the enrollment uh, page looks like. Uh, and here's a little bit about how to invite family members. All right, so uh, study procedures. Um, first, we uh, have participants fill out a baseline questionnaire um, and attend the family health fair, the minimum data collected include completion of the questionnaire and donation of biospecimens. So at that point is when somebody is uh, fully enrolled in the study. We also ask for consent to release medical records to 10,000 families. And um, we really don't want to be getting 
up to 75,000 people's paper records. Uh, so currently we're exploring how to get a um, feed of uh, electronic health record data from the larger health systems in the state uh, so that we can um, just grab the data uh, with people's consent rather than um, receiving and abstracting a huge amount of paper. We asked for consent to link to the cancer registry. Uh, and so um, that's obviously one central source of cancer diagnoses. Consent for ongoing contact uh, and then um, consent to integrate uh, their data with uh, publicly available data. All right, so I mentioned the questionnaire, and you always ride a, a fine line between getting comprehensive data and wearing out your participants. Um, and these are the modules that we have. <clears throat> Michelle, can you remind me how long it's been taking people to finish? Just over 30 minutes. So despite this number of modules, it's a little uh, uh, not as long as you might think. Partly that's because um, you know, there's some branching logic, and so uh, if you don't smoke or drink alcohol, then you don't have to answer this um, long module. Uh, but so uh, the modules are health habits, physical activity, which we got from the vital cohort, tobacco and alcohol use came from the southern communities cohort, medical conditions from the um, cancer prevention study three from American uh, Cancer Society, uh, family history, residential community, activity and performance, uh, chemical exposures, women's health, uh, quality of life, men's health, occupation, and uh, diet, and especially meat preparation. Of note, all these are from um, existing studies or, or validated modules so that we can easily uh, pool our data with um, other studies. Logan? Yeah. So um, young kids uh, need to have a parent fill it out. Um, for adults that are competent, they fill out their own questionnaires. Um, yeah, and I forget at what age we let kids fill out their own questionnaire. 18, there we go. You know, within families, everybody's got their own idea, and they have to all remain linked. So it was actually a, a big deal to put this in action. So. I can imagine there might be some significant in, inconsistencies, say, family reporting, family history. Somebody may have been more variable than this and didn't have a role in it. We'll find out. <laughs> um, no, you're absolutely right. Um, all right, so uh, we also have a detailed pediatric questionnaire. Um, and since uh, Jen Pointer and I are the, the pediatric point people, we um, came up with this. It includes uh, prenatal and delivery uh, questions, um, questions about breastfeeding, sleep patterns, growth and development, um, presence of pets, family history, uh, immunization, uh, and, and so on. And, and we picked these mainly because uh, they have um, relevance to pediatric cancer. And they aren't really looked at in the context of adult cancer. And clearly, we won't be able to look at them for several decades yet. Uh, but when we get there, uh, we'll all be very happy that we have these data. All right, so um, then we invite them to the health fair where we get more uh, hands-on measurements, things that we wouldn't be able to get from a questionnaire, um, or we get more accurately. So you can get height and weight from a questionnaire, but uh, usually the men are taller and, and the women are slimmer uh, than when you actually measure them. Uh, we get lung function, electrocardiogram, blood pressure, grip strength, hearing. MMSE is the mini mental state exam, a vision exam, and then the digital clock test. And that's where you ask people to draw a clock from memory uh, and their ability to do so tells you something about the, the state of their um, cognition. Now, we don't give all these to everybody. We're not giving the MMSE to, to people under 50, 40. Um, uh, we are not giving grip strength to, to little kids. 
Um, but this is, uh, you know, a, a tiered approach to, to phenotyping people depending on their age. I should add that many of these are app enabled. So, for instance, uh, we're using a digital pen for the clock test that uh, not only um, that that actually measures their time and I think you know whether they're shaking and so on. So it's uh, um, some sophisticated uh, sophisticated modes of analysis. All right, at the uh, health fair, we are getting a number of biospecimens, including hair and nails, uh, saliva, which is um, also for the uh, for DNA. We don't get stool at the fair, but we send them home with a kit, and I'll update you on um, the return. Um, and then we're getting uh, blood, which is uh, being processed in uh, a state-of-the-art uh, manner. Um, we're going to have a lot of aliquots of serum, plasma, red blood cells, PAC cells. Um, we've got uh, cells which are going to undergo flow cytometry uh, and be uh, cryopreserved. We've got PAX gene tubes so that we will have um, stable RNA. Uh, and then lastly, we get a urine sample, uh, which is um, stored uh, in the state of the art. So um, what are these samples for? Um, for DNA, uh, for the uh, uh, saliva sample, we obviously get genomic DNA, but also oral microbiome. In the stool sample, we get gut microbiome. We get all sorts of things from the uh, blood sample, uh, including the ability to make um, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells from the blood. And I forget, was that part of the consent? Ability to make iPSCs? Added to it, yep. Uh, so state-of-the-art blood collection that will have many downstream uses. Uh, from the hair, nails, and urine, well, you can measure lots of things in urine. In hair and nails, uh, we can look at uh, heavy metals. Um, which, which in my youth meant uh, Metallica, but now I understand is some form of uh, health problem. So um, that's it for the health fair. I guess I'll pause briefly for questions. And if you have questions, let's get them on the mic so people in Duluth and Hormel can hear you. Anyone? So s super exciting. Um, is, I guess I'm, I'm curious to know how a study like this works if people move away out of the state or out of the country and if it happened differentially somehow, would it, is it a concern of the, a cohort study like this? And I guess the second question is, you know, given that you guys are interested in pediatric cancer, is it big enough? Can you estimate if, you know, a study like this big enough to learn something about exposures? or genetics that would influence pediatric cancer risk? Yeah, I mean, there's no cohort large enough to have pediatric cancer as the frank outcome. Uh, so that's just not going to happen. But um, if we have blood samples from two-year-olds, and, you know, that's the target tissue for leukemia, um, you know, Aaron Marcotte's looking for um, leukemic translocations in, in, in uh, circulating in health, otherwise healthy kids, you know, this would be an ideal context to, to look for that. Um, and most of pediatric cancers seem to have to do with patterns of growth and development of different tissues. We'd also be able to look at that. So, you know, I have plenty of kind of uh, mechanistic or contextual studies that we could do for pediatric cancer, but I'll, I'll admit that, um, you know, out of 7,000 kids, you're going to get seven cancers. Yeah. Well, when you, just a detailed question. You mentioned you're going to consent patients to... Uh, allow access to the electronic health record. Mm -hmm. How are you going to then access the electronic health record? So uh, we've met with Constantine uh, Alaferis from uh, Institute for Health Informatics, you know, who has been working on these kind of agreements. And, and basically, you have two kinds of agreements with the, the health providers. One is you give them the, the name and record number, and they return to you the records you want. And that's uh, less desirable because, you know, then you have to sort through them. You don't know what they have. They give you a data dump, and it's a lot of work, and it's a one-time thing. Or if you get it all. If you get it all. 
The, the other option is, uh, is a feed where we basically can go in and grab what we need, and, and that's what we would aim for. Uh, we did get, you know, good direction from Constantine who told us that uh, it costs about ten to $15,000 to set up that kind of feed, mostly in the administrative material MTA kind of um, costs. So, um, you know, that's, that's actually a pretty good bargain to be able to get these data, if you ask me. Yeah, Brian. Um, two questions. One, you're collecting an enormous amount of material, so I'm not trying to add to it, but have you talked about doing uh, transforming lymphocytes, EBV transforming, so you have a constant potential supply of those? And then the second question is, how do you envision access to the samples and the data? They are limiting. So if an investigator is interested in a particular question, do you have a review panel that will review a proposal and make decisions about who has access to that information? So um, to answer your first question, um, you know, they are consented to create IPSC, and I think that would, you know, uh, transform lymphocytes would be under the same uh, umbrella. We don't have funds to do it right now, and I'm not sure about the practicality of doing it on, you know, nearly 100,000 people. Uh, but if it were practical, we'd be more than happy to. Um, to answer your second question, absolutely, these samples are uh, going to be open to the university community, and you know we've been working on the data infrastructure, and now we're getting samples and data, uh, and so the plan is to put together an oversight board that would approve of um, requests. Uh, and just to be clear, you know, eventually we're going to have to charge. For the access, uh, and the idea would be that you know you put in an NIH grant, uh, and that will easily cover any access fees. So, yeah. So you, you didn't answer the question about people being. Oh lost right, sorry, I, I, I got it, uh, hit left and right. So um, you know, first of all, you can passively track them. So uh, if they die in the U.S., they're in the National Death Index. Uh, soon there will be a um, ability to link to cancer registries around the country, uh, which the problem has been that we have 52 cancer registries in this country. So there's passive follow-up. Uh, there's also the fact that we have um, the family members who are going to stay in Minnesota, so we will know where they are. They can answer questionnaires from anywhere. Um, you know, if they have family here, chances are they're going to visit here, uh, and we can capture them when they visit. Um, but there is always a loss to follow up in a, in a, um, in a cohort study. And uh, there are analytic methods for uh, dealing if it's, uh, if it's um, you know, differential uh, based on some baseline characteristic. Uh, you know, epidemiologists in observational research, the answer is always we'll collect the data and take care of it in the analysis. Um, but then what percent of Minnesotans do you think stay in state? Or, or they go to Boston and they come back. Yeah. It's about 70% of people in the state were born in the state, and the rest of them were born in Iowa. All right, so um, pilot wave number one. Uh, this started at the state fair. Uh, we were there at, for 12 hours, uh, stuffed into um, the little booth next to the garage door at the Dan Patch building. Um, and you know, it was on the, the cancer day. Um, so volunteers indicated interest in the state fair. Uh, we screened 168 people in, in 12 hours, um, and Goldie visited us. Uh, and so um, our index participant is the person who filled out the survey uh, at, the, um, at the state fair. You can see it's about slightly over 75% female, uh, which doesn't surprise me entirely. Uh, we have been tracking other large cohort efforts, and so, for instance, the American Cancer Society Cancer Prevention Study 3, uh, which um, I and several other people in this room joined, uh, ended up being 76% female. So um, hopefully uh, with the um, family study design, we'll actually end up getting more males uh, because, um, you know, the... the um, female member might be the index, uh, but then she'll uh, tell her husband or kids that they have to do it. 
Um, <clears throat> that goes on behind the scenes. Of course, everybody gets their own individual choice. Um, our index participants were 18 to 83 at the fair. Um, and the family members who signed up were, were literally from zero to 100. So we did have a 100-year-old uh, who, who joined the study. Um, screening, it was not surprisingly at the fair, at the university building, uh, even less diverse than um, the state fair as a whole. So uh, our index participants were 95% uh, uh, white um, with a, a smattering of, of uh, diversity. Uh, and then, not too surprisingly, so were the family members. Uh, and so we acknowledge that this is a problem for the um, study and one that we are um, very consciously going to rectify. Uh, here's where they came from. Uh, we got some nice maps from, uh, from Kevin Riley. Uh, and you can see that the index participants, like fairgoers, were concentrated in the metro area, uh, but with some people from further out state, including, anybody know where that is? All right, we'll go with Detroit Lakes. So um, in any case, it's people from far away. Um, questionnaires uh, we got back from index participants and family members uh, were um, just like the participation. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, the people who participated were overwhelmingly white. Uh, and this is where they came from. All right, so uh, we got their uh, eligibility screener in August uh, for the, from the fair. Uh, and then we had to scramble to work on the um, website, the emailing protocol, and so on. Uh, and so we first contacted them uh, to invite them uh, into the study in early October. Is that right? Um, early October. Uh, and we um, ended up taking them through the questionnaire, uh, signing up another family member, and then invited them to health fair number one, which was held at the uh, ECRC, uh, the Epidemiology Clinical Research Center, uh, which is uh, right there at Washington um, by Izzy's, if you've ever been there for ice cream. Uh, and we ended up with uh, 33 participants, which were from 10 families. Uh, learned a lot. It was a very long day, uh, and among other things, we found out where the bottlenecks are, um, how difficult it is to have three generations uh, in the same uh, place. Uh, we had a very kind family that, um, that uh, invited the uh, father. The grandparents were divorced for a long time. Uh, I'm not sure entirely what their... Uh, level of communication was, but nevertheless, the, uh, uh, the father came. So you get a lot of interesting family dynamics, um, and uh, it was definitely a, an eye-opening uh, eye opening, um, procedure. Uh, we did end up getting slightly more females into the fair, um, although a healthy share of males, uh, not surprisingly considering our pool of potential participants, uh, overwhelmingly white. Um, relationship to the index participant, uh, nearly half of the um, family members were the children. 28% um, were siblings or spouse. 24% were the um, parents of the index participant. And um, we have uh, a tiered consent, meaning that they can uh, do check boxes on um, uh, each of the items. So we asked them if we can use the biological samples. Uh, that one, you know, should be 100%. Uh, we also asked whether other scientists can use the, the samples, uh, and nearly everyone agreed to that. Uh, everyone agreed to use of the genetic material. We took pains to say in the future because we don't currently have funds for sequencing. Um, Nearly everybody gave a permission to use it in the future by other scientists. We asked about commercial use of the data or samples, partly because some of the instruments we're using are um, made by for-profit companies uh, who may wish to use the data for norming, uh, and people were less enthused about that. 
we asked about contact for future studies, not for the 10,000 family study, but if we want to bring them in uh, for a sub-study. And most people were okay with that. We asked whether they would like to receive medically actionable results, uh, either from uh, phenotyping that we do or eventually from uh, sequencing. Uh, and then lastly, uh, did they um, consent to link to the cancer registry? So uh, not surprisingly for people who showed up on a November Saturday uh, fasting to uh, get phenotyped for three or four hours, uh, they were a pretty compliant group. Uh, here's the percentages that we got for um, each of the uh, measures. You notice the numbers are a little bit different uh, depending on um, which uh, instrument was uh, being administered. So the MMSE, this is only from uh, people over 40. So 100% of them did that. All right, so um, we'd say that the first health fair was a learning experience, um, but also a success. So we do have data and samples in hand. Uh, pilot waves two and three are happening now. So um, here we are testing recruitment through the birth file. Uh, so just so you know, the birth file in the, in the state is public um, for about 90% of Minnesota, uh, births in Minnesota. Basically, if the parents are married, it's automatically public. If the parents are unmarried, the mother can consent to make it public, and it works out to about 90% of the birth file. Uh, there is a process for getting access to the last 10%, um, and considering that I think that's probably the worst off 10% of Minnesotans, that it's probably worth our while to get that access so that we uh, have a method of identifying and recruiting um, people from the, the you know, lower portions of SES in the state. Data that we have includes the parents' and children's names, uh, address at birth, date of birth, parental education, and race ethnicity. So a pretty good basis to, to know who's responding when we mail them. Uh, and the pilot's testing the cold contact. So in other words, at least at the fair, people were talking to us, interacting, uh, could sort of get an idea of what they'd be buying into. Here we're just sending them a letter followed by a, um, followed by a uh, postcard asking them to go to the website and uh, take a look. And so we will find out soon. Uh, letters went out uh, not too long ago. Um, we'll find out soon what the response is to a, a cold contact. We picked two areas for pilot waves two and three. Those of you who are listening in Austin, we picked uh, Mauer County and Surrounds, uh, although you'll notice we did not pick Olmstead. Uh, I don't need to explain why. Um, and we sent letters to uh, all the births that happened in the last 12 months, um, parents with all the births in the last 12 months in these um, four counties. Uh, and then we, um, and why did we pick this area? Uh, it was mainly because Hormel Institute is there uh, and has uh, some clinic rooms uh, and space that would be, allow us to, to, to hold the health fairs. Secondly, we picked, um, these four zip codes in uh, North Minneapolis and suburbs uh, because they are from, uh, have a more diverse populace uh, and um, we wanted to see what response would be from there. Um, so uh, getting them to open the envelope is the first step to enrolling them. So we did do a, a little randomized experiment. Uh, we put stickers on the um, envelope or sorry, we had a spray on logo uh, now, oh, and we had a handwritten address. Uh, the theory is that the um, logo would maybe intrigue them a little, and the handwritten address would make it look like, you know, uh, a person wrote them instead of uh, an institution or a machine. So uh, we're waiting to see what uh, the results are of that. So, uh, you know, if we come back in um, August, we can tell you about uh, the results of uh, pilot waves two and three. And I guarantee you, no snow. Um, so just a little bit more about uh, how we've thought about uh, our procedures. Um, we do plan on returning study results, individual results, to, uh, to the participants. 
So it's always possible to return aggregate results. You know, we published this, we found this. Uh, it, but people want to know their individual results. Uh, and so um, we're currently returning some results from the physical exam, height and weight, which is not really uh, difficult for people to obtain, BMI and blood pressure. Um, and we will return some lab results that are uh, CLIA certified, including uh, lipids, creatinine, glucose, complete blood counts. More thorny is the return of um, genomic analysis. So participants did consent for whole genome sequencing, uh, which means that we have a high likelihood of uh, revealing um, actionable medical results in uh, some participants. You know, those of you who do genomic work in uh, people know this is an evolving area, uh, but the kind of industry standard has become to rely on the American College of Medical Genetics to declare what an actionable result is. And uh, so we will only return um, that to people if they consent to receive it. And we would do that in collaboration with genetic counseling. But we acknowledge it's a rapidly moving area, uh, so the policy will be revisited periodically. All right, we have a number of uh, innovations that uh, 10,000 families is, is bringing to the table. Number one is the family design. Uh, I certainly have seen birth cohorts where you get the mother and child or both parents and child, uh, but I'm not sure I've ever seen a three-generation cohort or at least not one on this scale. So uh, it will enable analyses. Uh, it will enable um, assays that you know, nobody's done before. Uh, we are working on automated data collection, so uh, app-enabled data collection and so on, uh, which includes mobile apps. So for instance, um, diet is not easy to measure by food frequency questionnaire. Most people can't remember what they ate three days ago, um, much less what they normally eat. And people are also a, a little self-deceiving or optimistic about their diet. Um, and so food frequency questionnaires are not uh, very well regarded these days. But people can usually remember what they ate yesterday. Uh, so for instance, if we um, enable an app to uh, get a 24-hour food recall, um, we could pick a random day, ping somebody in the study, and get their 24-hour food recall um, going forward. We will be uh, querying the EMRs. We are building the cultural competency to enroll uh, underrepresented groups. Um, we are uh, working on scalable electronic data capture using some of the commercial instruments. Uh, Heather mentioned the um, that we're putting together the Minnesota Population Database, uh, which will give us a lot of contextual information um, about, uh, honestly, every Minnesotan, but uh, in particular the ones in this study. We will be getting um, uh, fecal microbiome samples, uh, and in the future may uh, get microbiome from other uh, areas of the body. Uh, I forgot to add, we sent people home with the stool kits, uh, and we have almost exactly 50% return, uh, which is, uh, doesn't sound like a lot. Um, but if you talk to the people who regularly um, collect these samples, you know, it's usually the first time that, uh, that people have to get over uh, and realize that it's not as bad as they thought. And um, after that, they'll, they'll happily send you all the time. So uh, at least for that 50%, we can get uh, serial samples. Uh, our collaboration is now wide, so it includes the Coordinating Centers for Biometric Research, which is those of you who don't know, it's a core unit in um, biostatistics that runs large uh, cohort studies or clinical trials, uh, and so very experienced in, um, in uh, handling large um, data sets like this. Uh, collaborator in Occupational Therapy is very excited about the ability to look at Functional, um, functional ability in, in older adults, uh, instituted child development. Uh, many of our team members are from epidemiology and community health. Uh, 
Ardle is involved in uh, processing and banking the samples. Of course, uh, Dr. Pointer and I are in the Department of Pediatrics, uh, and we've been um, talking with UMGC about using the samples. And uh, at this point, we'd just like to, to invite everyone else to become collaborators as well. All right, so uh, here's the million, or rather $20 million question. Uh, how do we go from a um, pilot funded with a lot of elbow grease and $100,000 from Masonic Cancer Center to uh, a multi-generational, longitudinal, epochal study that will outlast everybody in this room? All right. Um, I think first, we're obviously tapping uh, local funding. The Masonic Cancer Center we're very thankful for and, and we hope to receive further funding from. Uh, philanthropy. I think that um, while people have a uh, tendency to like to build buildings or something tangible, uh, what I'd like to pitch this to our donors at, uh, as is a, um, you know, an, an institution in and of itself. The way that we still talk about Framingham, which is a, you know, frankly nothing town, because they've devoted themselves to um, generations of participating in health research, we hope that uh, the funders and uh, philanthropists will see the value in this sort of multi-generational longitudinal study. And we're not above asking the legislature, uh, especially since I just read that we have a $300 million surplus. Um, secondly, we would like people to apply for funding to use the data and samples as they accrue. Uh, and we're already in talks amongst ourselves about studies that we might do. And uh, that's on the next slide. And then, of course, we will apply to NIH. Uh, there are several calls for new cohorts, um, albeit it's still a very tough road. Just for perspective, NCI hasn't funded a large participation-based sample-heavy epidemiology cohort since the early 2000s when they funded the Southern Community Cohort. But there are uh, calls for new cohorts in, uh, at NHLBI, and there is one at, uh, at um, NCI. It's just that the bar is very high. So uh, here's some initial uses we thought of uh, using the 10,000 families data and samples. So for instance, uh, I'm very interested in de novo mutations, which are uh, definitely a way that pediatric cancer is sustained in the population and uh, probably some adult cancer. Uh, we know that parental age, particularly paternal age, is a main driver, but we don't know if there are environmental factors that uh, also affect uh, the prevalence of de novo mutations. So because we're collecting in families, we can look at that. We're looking at the impact of mother-child chimerism uh, in health. So uh, uh, women who've had babies will carry cells from their uh, kids uh, around for years, uh, which have been found in, in tumors, um, and apparently will also turn you into a cat. No, this is just an easy example of a chimera. Uh, we also have the possibility of uh, looking at family-based microbiome. In other words, uh, how similar are our families in their microbiome, how much of that is uh, influenced by diet, uh, et cetera. So uh, Brian, you asked about when these data and samples will be available to people. They are uh, available immediately in concept, and uh, then we just need to form a board to, um, to, uh, to um, vet the requests. Um, the other thing is any data that gets generated from the samples, we would require that it gets turned back to the study so that uh, others could make use of it. So uh, that's it. Um, this is sort of our motto. We're stumbling towards uh, our procedures and, um, and study design, uh, but the end goal is clear. It would be 10,000 families that we enroll and follow uh, for as long as we can keep it going. Uh, and I'm channeling our, our inner Homer Simpson, uh, who said, if you don't do anything, you'll never make mistakes. And so while we're making mistakes, uh, at least we're doing something. And thank you, and I left five minutes for questions. 
let's start over here. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask um, if, like, a family has um, and wants to participate but has some adopted children in it, would, like, have you thought about um, how to go about handling that? We didn't define family as genetically related precisely okay. because they're adoptive families, um, you know, same-sex couples, you, you name it, uh, that uh, we didn't want to limit it that way. And um, obviously you can't look at um, – transmission, genetic transmission between a, a adopted kids, um, but adopted kids have uh, value in research for that very reason, because yeah. you can look at the, the environment without the genetics. Yeah. As I'm walking, I'm wondering if a family has grandparents in state, one child in state, one child moved out of state, do you track that out of state relative? We haven't gotten as far as enrolling anybody from out of state. Um, they need to be residents in Minnesota at the time of enrollment, um, but that's a, a possibility. Yeah. We also have snowbirds to deal with. <laughs> so thank you for doing this, Logan. It's it's a phenomenal undertaking, and, and as you know, phenomenal PI. There's okay, lots of people but, involved. But yeah. as you know, when we we had proposed this in the medical discovery, the, the critiques we got one: how can you do this? It's going to be very hard. And number two, it's going to take a long time. Well, both of, both of those are, are reasonable criticisms, but it can be done, and in a long time, you'll have some very valuable information. Look, one of the one of the um, benefits of being in academia is we don't have to have a, a shareholder next quarter kind of um, perspective. No, we do have a let's get a five year grant perspective, um, and that's what makes this idea very difficult because we are talking about generations long and some of the benefits going to accrue to people who are you know in kindergarten now yeah, and absolutely. they're the scientists of tomorrow um, I fully expect that if we pull this off some of the kids in the study will end up at the U working on the study <laughs> um, but uh, you know because Minnesota is this high capital high social capital state where people like to stay I think it's precisely why we have to do it here so the, the question I have then is, there is a, a, a Minnesota cohort. I wonder if you have talked about integrating into that because they've already volunteered. There's information. That's talking about twin, Eric? The, I'm talking about the twin study. Ah. Uh, I have talked to the twins um, studies. They are calling people back in, um, but they're not currently open to, to expanding the range of things they're asking. Other questions or comments? Thanks very much, Logan. Thank you.